All right, let's learn about some integumentary dysfunction. And as always, I usually go over the pediatric differences that you need to know about. Usually I go over differences between adults and pediatrics. However, on this slide, I want you to look at the differences between newborn and adolescent skin. Think about it. If you have impaired circulation, say from a heart condition, which we know that children can have, will you get good skin healing? No. What if you take corticosteroids for a chronic condition? No. Impaired wound healing, and not just from major pressure ulcers, but from little things like scrapes, bruises, and small cuts, all affect children. And all of that is affected by the uh, factors that are listed for you in Table 47.1 you really should review that table. So these are some common pediatric skin issues that you see, obviously, in children. Um, Epitigo, folliculitis, cellulitis, molluscum contagiosum. This is caused by the pox virus. It causes multiple pearl-like, they're flesh-colored smooth papules. The lesion has a central depression and a plug of cheesy material can be expressed when punctured. Doesn't that just sound disgusting? But in a weird way, as a nurse, it kind of sounds really cool because nurses are like pimple poppers, right? Um, cont molluscum contagiosum is common along the face, the trunk, and the extremities. Adolescents may have lesions in the genital mucous membranes. Children usually have 20 or so uh, lesions that appear um, either singly or they can appear in groups. Each lesion will last for around six months, but new lesions can appear for over two to four years. Other things, um, you guys are probably familiar with ringworm. Psoriasis can also affect children. Lice, I'm not going to go over lice. You can review lice if you don't know how to take care of lice or what to do about it. Scabies, hemangiomas, and pressure ulcers. If you're a squeamish person, this may be a little bit of a difficult PowerPoint. So first we'll talk about things that cause infections of the skin. We're talking about things like impetigo, folliculitis, cellulitis, and staph infections. You should definitely read through the MRSA interventions as well, because again, this is something we see in the community. All right, now we'll talk a little bit about viral skin infections. These are things we're talking about like roseola, rubella, chickenpox. Less common are Veruca. Veruca are warts that are caused by various strains of HPV. And then of course uh, the herpes simplex types 1 and 2, varicella zoster, and then again the molluscum contagiosum that we already kind of talked about. So what I want you guys to uh, look up um, just look up, you know, what is what are the nursing interventions? How do you care for these types of viral um, and infectious skin infections? Uh, what advice? What would be your uh, discharge teaching uh, to parents if you saw these things? Um, what would be your medication teaching? Those are the things that I test you on. All right, so fungal infections again. Uh, picture A is the tinea capitis. It's basically the fungal infection on the head. Uh, picture B is tinea corporis, also known as ringworm. Again, when you look at fungal infections, I want you to think about what is the nursing care associated with fungal infections? What kinds of meds, how is it treated? What kind of meds, you know, would you anticipate? And what kind of teaching would you give to parents? Especially about transmitting, you know, back and forth. All right, poison ivy, oak, and sumac. If a child comes in contact with any of these awful, awful plants, I do not know why they were ever created, um, immediately wash the area with cold water. Make sure that you remove the clothing um, that has been exposed to the, um, to the poison ivy as well. Because if it's really the oil from the plant, that's what the oil can get into the clothes um, and cause reinfections. It's interesting to note that even Roundup, which will kill nearly anything, will not kill poison ivy. And as far as other, you know, things, you guys should have already talked about a lot of other first aid for bites and stings uh, from the ER chapter already. All right, scabies. 
This is so gross, I just have to tell you. Female mites burrow into the skin and they drop off feces and eggs. They literally deposit them in your skin. If it's the first time this has happened, then the sensitization won't occur for 30 to 60 days afterwards. So one to two months after you get infected with these nasty mites, that's when you finally start to have symptoms. But if it's happened before, then the sensitization will um, be much quicker. 48 hours will mount, will mount the response. Areas over which the mites um, have traveled will itch and the mites will erupt from the little eggs. Um, again, <laughs> that's the infestation. You should know that uh, scabies is treated with a uh, permethrin cream. You gotta treat everybody. <laughs> you need to treat everybody who's been in contact with the individual because it's so contagious. Um, your textbook also talks about lice. Um, I'm not going to go over that because I think you guys have already covered that in the skin unit. You should have. Um, and if not, you can read about lice on your own. It just makes everybody's head itch just the minute you start talking about it. Dermatitis. More than half of the dermatological issues in children are just various forms of dermatitis. Dermatitis, the good news is that it is reversible. It's usually caused from inflammation. It can be acute or it can be chronic. Chronic dermatitis is obviously going to yield some permanent effects such as scarring or pitting of the skin. And the four most common types of dermatitis you see in children are listed for you on your slide. Contact dermatitis is just usually an allergic reaction to something that has made contact with the skin. Common triggers are listed for you on your slide. The best treatment is to figure out the cause of, that's causing the allergic reaction and get rid of it. <laughs> Steroids may be helpful to help speed up the healing um, and slow down that inflammatory process. Other forms of relief can include lukewarm baths, baths in oatmeal or baking soda, lightweight clothing, which I mean really think about it. Who, wear, who walks around wearing a heavy kilt and heavy wool anymore? Nobody. Lightweight clothing cracks me up when I read it. You also may need to, children may also need to wear mittens during sleep so that they don't scratch themselves. Good luck with that. Um, Benadryl or hydroxazine may be helpful to relieve some of the itching. Uh, how long should children soak in the tub? Usually no more than 30 minutes or the children will start to chill. How do you entertain kids in a bath? How do you make them sit in a bath for 30 minutes? Well, good news is most of the children like to take a bath, so that helps. But toys. You can get special dolls for a bath. You can get play dishes. You can get uh, like little squirt toys for the bath. Um, get little water guns and let them, you know, shoot the walls of the bathtub. That's always fun for boys. Fun ways to apply uh, lotion or medicine to uh, skin conditions in a pediatric friendly way. Get a fun little paintbrush and let the children paint paint their, you know, lotion or paint their, you know, hydrocortisone on or, you know, whatever it is. So there's a fun pediatric friendly way to do it. And these pictures just break my heart. Oh, diaper dermatitis. God bless these poor children who are just, ugh, that just looks painful. Yeast is the most common cause of, di of diaper rash. Um, again, it's going to have that bright red. Sometimes it's not quite that bright red, I'll be honest with you. But it usually has a red scaly plaque. The big take-home point here is it feels sandpapery when you touch it. Um, again, it's going to need to be treated with um, nice statin cream. Usually it's applied like four times a day or about every other diaper change. Or you can be like a hyper mom like me when your kids get a yeasty diaper rash, you just apply it every single time because, you know, I'm overkill. Atopic eczema. Uh, this is a chronic relapsing superficial inflammatory type response. It causes a lot of itching and irritation for children. I put some statistics on there about how many children are affected. And remember how we talk about that strange triad between asthma, um, allergic rhinitis, uh, food intolerances, and eczema. I guess that's four things, so technically it's not a triad. But 
all that like allergic, like food allergies, um, asthma, um, and then eczema, they all kind of three kind of go together. Um, and this is that kind of eczema that we're talking about. There does seem to be a genetic predisposition, um, but there's some sort of an immune system trigger. The immune system is just wicked hyper with eczema and it just needs to just chill out. Okay, so acute eczema is characterized by patches of vesicles, exudate, and crusts. Um, because this is going to be so itchy, it's not uncommon for this type of rash to, uh, for the vesicles and things to kind of open up or like weep and then crust over. It's so gross. Then you can have subacute, which is characterized by scaling, erythema, and excoriation. Again, patches may weep. Chronic. Um, you can start to get that thickened skin, um, dryness, scaling, things like that. Hard part is that they say that there's no cure for eczema, but if you go to Walmart or if you watch TV, there is all kinds of eczema creams that are touted um, to be the cure that will eliminate your eczema. Good luck. My second child um, suffered from eczema when he was little. Um, and he was just a he was just a mess. It was usually on his arms and it was usually on his legs. And he would get to the subacute phase where the patches would weep and they would crust over. Um, I think we tried every single eczema cream on the market um, to no avail and nothing really worked. So good luck. Uh, the goal of course is to hydrate and lubricate the skin. Um, you need to try and prevent secondary infections because when those uh, when the skin opens up and if those uh, lesions weep, then that's an open pathway for infection. So trying to keep it really clean, prevent any secondary infections is important. Topical steroids are amazing. They can be used to achieve quick control, um, but again, it's not a long-term solution, but it will help calm the eczema flare-ups down. I will tell you, the, uh, trying to figure out the cause of the eczema is probably your best bet, and that is hard. Um, eczema may not always be caused by topical sources. It may be caused by things that the child is eating. For example, my son suffered from eczema since he was a baby. We did not figure out that he had celiac disease until he was much older. So once we cut the gluten out of his diet, Magically, he started digesting food a lot better, but also I noticed his eczema cleared up and the child doesn't have a speck of eczema on his body now. So, and he even cheats and eats um, gluten from time to time and he still doesn't break out with it. So for him, for whatever reason, gluten for a period of time was really causing this allergic type reaction. And once we cut that out and he, we cleaned up his diet, then the eczema went away. I'm not saying that was the cure. I'm not saying that will cure every single child. I'm just telling you what my experience was because I know as a parent, I just about nearly pulled my hair out and researched Google to death, trying to find a cure, trying to find something to take away this awful eczema from my child. Seborrheic dermatitis. This is also known as cradle cap. Um, you see this in uh, babies, usually not newborns. It's after they've, you know, sometime within their first year of life. But they get this kind of crusty yellow scales on their scalp. Um, and you really just need to like pick it and dig it off as a nurse. And as a parent, you just want that off. Sometimes um, it can be also caused from an overgrowth of yeast. Treatment. Um, you're going to have to use some Nizerol shampoo or some Selsun Blue, uh, something like that. You can, uh, sometimes people tell you to brush olive oil on the scalp first with like the little scrub brushes that you use to scrub your nails with at the hospital. Um, the olive oil will help kind of loosen the scales. Um, if you use any kind of tar containing shampoo, which is, you know, one of the treatments, just make sure you uh, watch, make sure it doesn't run in the baby's eyes because it's going to burn and sting like crazy. Acne. I love how your book says it's thought to be triggered by puberty. Well, no kidding, Sherlock. Thank you so much, Captain Obvious, because we all, none of us could figure that out. 
Gee. Sorry. Um, acne is not caused by dirt necessarily, but it's caused by testosterone, which of course is increased during puberty. When else is testosterone increased? When women are preggers, especially when they're preggers with a baby boy. It's not uncommon at all for pregnant mamas of boys to have especially more breakouts while during their pregnancy. Unfortunately, it's also common for women during PMS, and that includes adolescence as well. Uh, you can read about the, the different theories of acne on your slide. But you basically you get inflammation occurs with the proliferation of the propriony bacterium, which draws in the neutrophils and causes inflammation, papules, pustules, etc. It causes acne. Acne treatment. Most of the time it can be treated topically. Things like, um, you can read through it on your slide. Retin-A, I just want to say, specifically should be applied at night because drug stability is affected by light. We used to say apply it to the whole face. Now they say to apply it only to the three main areas of the face, the forehead, nose, and chin. Leave your cheeks alone. Stress to your patients to use sunscreen because it will make the sun more sun sensitive. It will make the skin more sun sensitive. Benzyl peroxide, this should be used in the morning, often as a first line agent. It's available in face washes, creams, gels. They also make combos with an antibiotic that's like a 5% benzyl peroxide and 3% erythromycin. Tetracyclines, uh, what's your big teaching point for tetracyclines? What does it do? It makes you photosensitive, yeah. So make sure you tell your patients to stay out of the sun. Tetracyclines are annoying because it takes six to eight weeks for improvement. So that oftentimes you combine those with a peroxide and a topical retinoid to prevent um, antibi antibiotic resistance. Accutane. Here's your big teaching point for it. If somebody's gonna be on Accutane, the girl has to come in for a monthly pregnancy test. And you have to stress, they must use contraception. Must. Not a, oh, no, I don't want to, no. Then you don't get Accutane. <laughs> you take Accutane with food to increase the absorption. You monitor cholesterol levels, triglycerides, and liver function. The reason why it's so important to not get pregnant while you take Accutane is because it's teratogenic. It will cause birth defects in a baby. It can also cause decrease in night vision, dry eyes, headaches, photosensitivity, photosensitivity depressions, and suicidal ideations. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty sucky to take Accutane and know that, I don't know what kind of a drug this is, and I don't know if anybody has had experience with it, but if it can cause teratogenic birth defects, so depression, suicidal ideations, headaches, wow. That's a lot of serious side effects that you, one would really have to weigh. This is definitely not just popping a simple little pill to cure up some acne here. Other things that can be used to help clear up acne, um, girls take oral contraceptives. Again, oral contraceptive teaching always says take your pill at the same time every day. See the package insert if you miss a pill about when, when you should take the pill and to get back on track. Beware, and oh, this is a big one. I will test you on this. I guarantee it. Beware of antibiotic use when you're taking birth control pills. Use a backup. And the reason is antibiotics compete for the same um, cellular uh, binding sites as birth control pills. And the antibiotics win. So then your birth control pills, you take them, but that's why they're not effective because they're competing for the same, you know, binding sites. Boards will test you. On that I almost guarantee it because everybody knows if you're going to take oral contraceptives if you have to go on antibiotics you have to take backup measures <laughs>